everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Aditya Shankar, and uh, this is part of the Reality Lab lecture series, also being jointly held at 481B, the VR capstone. Uh, and the goal basically is to have some of the great minds in VR and AR uh, come and share with us ideas that they have about the field and about their own research. Uh, today, we are very lucky to have Jeremy Galenson, who is a professor at Stanford. Uh, he did his PhD in cognitive psychology and has since for about 15 years work, been working on um, virtual humans, uh, perception, kind of how VR uh, affects how we perceive ourselves and others. Um, and also, you know, he's author of a, a book, uh, Experience on Demand, and he's also a co-founder of a company. Uh, so with uh, many different hats, uh, welcome Jerry, <coughs> and look forward to, what, to see what he has to say. Thank you. Yeah. So it's uh, wonderful to be here. Thanks for uh, that lo lovely introduction. Uh, David, thanks for getting me here safely. I appreciate it. Uh, and I'm really excited to get a chance to talk to people in this room, both the students who are designing projects uh, and who will also have a lifetime in VR and AR, most likely, uh, given the inspiration from the professors they get to work with here, uh, and also to the people who have come from the university and elsewhere. Um, this is my book, and I'm here not to talk about the book itself. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is reaction to the book. Uh, this book, uh, for better or worse, has you know had people given people an opportunity to think about what VR is and the role it's going to have in their institutions. And a lot of what I'll be talking about is pushback that I've gotten as we talk about VR entering mainstream society. So, uh, how many guys have been in VR before? I th raise your hands, please, if you've been in VR. Anybody not been in VR? Okay. Um, for those that have been in VR, has anybody not walked? Have they only been able to turn their heads? Okay. Um, how many of you guys have been in VR and gotten to walk the plank? Raise your hands if you've gotten to walk down a Fear of Heights demo or walk the plank. Okay, only a handful of you. So this is one of our signature demos that demonstrates something called presence. And I'm going to tell a story to start this out. In the year 2001, I was at UC Santa Barbara, and we had a VR lab there that we studied the psychology of VR. We took all of our bulky equipment back then. It wasn't a laptop, and it certainly wasn't just a pair of cameras. Loaded all this expensive hardware onto an airplane, went to Washington, D.C., where we presented to the Federal Judicial Center about how one would use virtual reality inside a courtroom. So what would you do with VR in a courtroom? You would recreate crime scenes. You would do police lineups so that witnesses could look at suspects. We talked about technology applications in the courtroom. There was about 500 people at the conference. A lot of them were federal judges, high-end trial lawyers. And uh, what we wanted to do was show them VR, running demos, and to talk about the applications. The signature demo that we still do today for the first demo is something called the pit. And what the pit is is you put on the goggles, and you look around, and you're in a 3D model of a room. It looks just like the actual room that you're in. We then hit a button, and we drop a chasm. That chasm is about 10 meters deep. And to get across, there's a really thin, rickety plank. It's about three meters to get across. And you've just got to walk across the plank. Now, at this conference, uh, we had this man come in. He was a federal judge, uh, probably in his mid to late 60s. He probably weighed north of 250 pounds. And as he was going over this plank, he took a step to the left. Okay? Of course, we model gravity. And so for his perceptual system, he saw the bottom of that pit rushing down from his eyes, and he heard the whoosh of the wind as he plummeted downward. If you were in the real world and you wanted to save your life, uh, you were halfway across that plank, what would you do? He would dive at a 45 degree angle because remember, you're going down to try to get the other edge of that chasm. And so here we are in Washington, D.C., in a room full of lawyers, and a federal judge from out of nowhere, just dives at a 45 degree angle. Okay. <laughs> it gets worse. This is my first public demo. I've since given thousands of them per year. And my render machine was stored on a table that had a very sharp corner. Okay. Uh, so this judge's face is going right toward this corner. I'm a 26 year old postdoc uh, and I have one move. My one move is to slam into him just to redirect his trajectory so his face doesn't hit the corner. Okay. Uh, he was okay. And we didn't get sued. Nobody went to jail. Uh, but this is a reaction that we call presence. Presence is defined as psychologists as the illusion of non-mediation. When VR is done well, there's no field of view. 
There's no resolution, there's no update rate, there's no latency, there's just an experience. And this notion of presence is that the medium literally disappears. Uh, that was with technology that is now 17 years old. In my lab, we host many, many tours, run many, many experiments. Uh, I'm not exaggerating that our spotters, people that make sure you don't fall down or hit a wall, probably save, I don't know if save a life would be too dramatic, uh, we certainly save major injuries every single week. Okay? Uh, this is called presence. Everything I'm going to talk about today takes as a presumption that VR is so real enough, it can create an experience that changes the way you think about yourself and others, and that begins with this notion of presence, that VR feels real. My lab at Stanford uh, is, a, from a technology standpoint, we have a tracking system that's a little better than most commercial system. It tracks your movements down to one-tenth of one millimeter uh, at an extremely high frame rate. Um, we do four different senses. So uh, sight, we use the normal goggles that can give you stereoscopic vision. We've got an array of 24 speakers that can actually spatialize sound so that the sound actually moves with the 3D object using an ambisonic sound system. We do haptics, virtual touch in two ways. Uh, we have a floor that shakes so that if there's an event that uh, should move your legs, your legs get boomed up from a floor that actually moves. And then we use commercial devices that will give you some vibrations uh, and haptic feedback. We do some virtual scent, uh, not too much because scent is fairly overpowering, but when the study warrants it, we do a lot of scent. Um, we work really hard to make these four senses work together. Um, while it is a destination technologically for many people, our strength is not publishing in engineering journals. Uh, my PhD is in psychology. Most of my PhDs are social scientists. What we do is on a good day, we have 40 or 50 experimental subjects come to the lab. They get some virtual reality experience, and we study what they do either in VR or later on. So now that I bragged about the technology in my lab, what I can tell you uh, is that my lab is becoming quickly obsolete from a technological standpoint. Um, so if you look at my lab's website, um, all of our publications, maybe 70% of them, are using one of these two pairs of goggles. Uh, each one is more expensive than my car. You know, I drive a Ford C-Max, so maybe that's not saying much, but uh, they cost about $40,000, these goggles. They're really heavy. Each one weighs about five pounds. Uh, really hard to imagine wearing these things for hours on end. Uh, as you know, the goggles we have today cost just a couple hundred dollars, and we've gone, you know, when I first started doing this work, when this guy went down, the Envis SX111, we were out of business for three weeks. We had to ship that to Boston. You know, Envis had maybe seven or eight engineers on staff. We had to wait for that thing to come back, and we had to go back and use one of our older HMDs, which didn't work with, uh, with the studies. You know, we literally had to stop running when there was a problem. There are now conservatively, conservatively 15 million high-end VR systems in the United States. So we've gone from this stunning trajectory where literally five years ago we were using this, and there was only about 1,000, maybe 1,500 of them in the world, and now there's tens of millions when you count things like Google Cardboard, that number goes up. So uh, the question that I get asked a lot, because remember, I, I do technology, but I'm, but I'm not an engineer. Uh, this is my grandfather, Popper. He's 91 years old in this picture. And he had this reaction that maybe not you guys in this room, but that a lot of people have when they try VR, which is, it's pretty cool, but what's the point? What am I really going to do in here? And most people that try VR, they don't get in their car, sprint to Best Buy, and drive and buy one of these uh, systems. It's kind of this thing you do, and it's pretty cool, but then what are you going to do with it? And so what we're going to talk about today for the next you know, 40-ish 40, 40 minutes is applications that I've found that actually justify being inside of virtual reality. And all of those applications leverage the paradox of what we call psychological presence. The paradox is this. In VR, the brain treats this experience as if it were real. When VR is done well, you are leveraging the sensory motor cortex because you're actually walking around and using your hands. Uh, we've talked about this concept of presence. The re when you do VR in a way that's compelling, the brain treats it as if it were a real experience. Uh, my colleague Byron Reeves, who's a media psychologist, he likes to say evolution takes a long time. VR is pretty new. So it's going to take some time for the brain to adjust to this concept where everything you're doing feels real, but it's actually digital. The other side of the paradox is that even though the brain treats it as if it were real, there are no rules. You can turn physics on and off. You can go back in time. You can grow a third arm. You can change your identity. You can grow 40 meters tall. There are absolutely no rules. However, 
any fantastical strange experience that a programmer designs, when I experience it, because my brain has no mechanism to deal with VR, our default is to treat it as if it were a real experience. So the VR applications that are ones that are going to stick, the ones that are going to be useful, are ones that leverage this paradox. The brain treats it as real, but you can't do it otherwise. So when I gave my intro about the book, the book was reviewed widely by the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and Science. And uh, in general, people liked the book. If there was a common critique from the book, the common critique was, Jeremy, you're this hippie from California. You talk about all these good applications of VR, but you need to talk about the bad sides. Now, uh, now, just so you know, chapter two of the book is all about the downsides of VR, but reviewers don't actually read books when they write their, their, their reviews oftentimes. Um, nonetheless, uh, I do think it's important, especially in this room with developers who are going to be building applications, to actually, front, fr you know, in the front of this talk, acknowledge some of the downsides of AR and VR. Uh, and the first one that I worry about is distraction. Okay, so um, I think UW's campus is not quite as bad as Stanford's in this front from just the, the day that I've spent here. But uh, on campus, typically students, their legs don't work unless their thumbs are moving. Right? They can't really walk unless they're texting. And um, in a world where all of your data gets brought up to your face, how do people actually navigate the world? So uh, we had our first death in VR as a field this past December. Uh, the first one that I know of, a uh, tragic event, a man in Moscow was playing uh, uh, a VR video game and fell through a plate glass table and bled to death. Um, uh, the good news is that's the only one that I've heard of. It's a very tragic event. But when I think about the downsides of VR, the one that keeps me up at night the most is stepping on the cat, walking into walls, getting mugged on subways. By definition, this is the most distractive medium ever invented. Second thing I want to talk about in this point, um, while I've been on this book tour, not that the book tour is going on, right after the book came out, I visited all the big tech companies, including all the phone companies that make VR, and I had a plea for them. I said, look, first of all, I'll ask you guys, how many people do you think are killed every single day by drivers who are using their phone while driving in the United States? Every day, how many people are killed by people texting and driving. The answer is about 10. Conservatively, about 10 people a day are killed because somebody is driving and texting. Now, imagine that you are at the beginning of the field of a smartphone. You know, smartphones are just coming out. You as an engineer, you get to make the decision. Should a phone work in a moving car? Now, me personally, I get a lot of my phone work when I'm driving. I go hands-free, and that's when I catch up on talking to people I haven't talked to in a while. So I talk hands-free on the phone in the car. But if you gave me a choice, Right now, we can go back in time and make it so that phones do not work in a moving car. I would say, let's do that. In other words, I value those 10 lives that are killed each day over the fact that I get to conveniently talk in the car. Now, let's fast forward to VR. We are in this moment of VR where VR is not yet everywhere. And we get to make design decisions. I know a lot of people in this room uh, work with and all the decision makers in the companies and government, we get to help people make this decision. And so when I talk to the phone the companies and the hardware companies, I say, look, I don't want to talk to you software people. Nothing wrong with you guys, but someone will be able to circumvent whatever you build. I want the hardware of virtual reality not to be able to work in a moving car. People say, no, what about the passengers? What about driverless cars? they got to do something. And I say, no, I do not want VR to work in a moving car. You may say, no one would ever use VR while driving. That sounds silly, right? We have a data point on this. Does anybody know the data point on this? It's a video game called Pokemon Go. It's an augmented reality video game where you hold up your tablet and you see video see through of the world while you chase these characters. And there are a number of, uh, not single digits, a number of documented car crashes that occurred because people were playing Pokemon Go while they're driving. So when, when I get five minutes alone with the CEO of these big companies, I say, please make it so VR simply does not work in a moving car. And so, um, distraction. Addiction. Uh, we have no data on this. Um, I don't know any psychologist that's willing to randomly assign you know, a couple hundred people to use VR for 10 hours a day and a couple hundred others to not. Uh, but there's no doubt that when online gambling feels like you're in Las Vegas, when social networking constantly feels like the best party you've ever been to, when pornography feels like adult activities actually, that it's, we're going to have to rethink how society is going to function. And so it's something to, to, to think about and flag. Simulator sickness. Um, you know, there's kind of three reasons for why you'd get simulator sickness. Uh, 
the hardware for the most part has caught up so that there's not high latency uh, and that there's a, a very fairly quick update rate, so that's not one reason. Um, some people just can't do VR. If you, if you can't be a passenger in a car, you're probably not going to love VR. Uh, what's relevant to the designers in this room is that it blows my mind. You know, I see demos and pitches from uh, every organization you can think of, ranging from undergrad to startups to governments who are doing VR applications. Don't move the camera. If the person is not walking, do not move the camera. And certainly do not rotate the camera. If you have to move the camera, move it slowly, but don't rotate that camera. And if you don't do that and you use basically good commercial hardware, and you, you're not going to get simulator sickness. Media modeling. Uh, there is a debate that's been going on for 30 or 40 years that I don't really call a debate. It's more like climate change deniers with a couple of loud critics. Hundreds and hundreds of experiments have shown, not from my lab, but if you're playing eight hours a day of violent video games, you will be more aggressive in the physical world. Hundreds of studies from across the globe showing this effect. Maybe the effect sizes are you know, small, uh, but there's no doubt this relationship exists. I'm not going to talk about desensitization of violence. The argument there is that you do all this violence and you become more comfortable with the concept so in the physical world you're desensitized to it. Uh, what we've done in my lab and just about every VR lab that has done work for the past few decades, many labs work with the US military to help our soldiers get better at combat. The notion of war games and simulation has been around long before there's been digital technology and a lot of VR has gone towards making soldiers better at their job, including work that we do in my lab. And I'm proud to do that work. The problem is when consumers will be able to buy virtual content that is just as compelling as the best boot camp that exists for our soldiers, if you fast forward five years from now, ten years from now, where the AAA games have been designed to be just as, you know, teaches you the same types of skills one learns during combat training, we will be in a position where any citizen who wants to learn to be better at violence will have the tools at their fingertips. And so I, I wrote a piece uh, for CNN, and I lobbied for the game community. First of all, I said video games are free speech. They should be protected. I'm a full fan of that. I don't want to regulate your games. I want them to exist, and I want to be able to play them. Uh, I asked designers to consider a set of three standards for violent video games when they're in VR. The idea is, can we build these games such that the violent skills you learn in the game do not generalize to make you more successful at doing violence when you leave? Standard number one is bullets should not go straight. The same way as when you throw a Frisbee, uh, if you want to hit something straight, you've got to throw it to the right. Okay? Standard number two, the input devices for shooter games should not be gun-shaped. Okay? I shouldn't learn the skills on how to hold an actual gun by playing the game. Maybe the way you shoot is by flicking your elbow. Standard number three is that the things that I'm trying to shoot at, they are not humanoid shaped, sized, and more importantly, they move in a trajectory that humans don't. So the skills you get for leading a running person don't generalize. And so I just set up these three standards um, uh, from the faces and the people in the room as I give this right now. Uh, you can guess this was not a well-received message in the gaming community. Um, but I will persist, and I, I think there is a fine line in which we can have our really intensely violent games as free speech and do them in a way that doesn't teach you how to be better at violence once you leave the game. So I leave the brilliant designers in this room to tackle this in one of the projects that you're doing. And, and what's the class number? Uh, 481. 481. Kids. Uh, so I, I work in Silicon Valley and I spend a lot of time talking to the technology companies. One of the questions the companies ask me to help them think about as well as government is, how old is too young? How young is too young to use VR? Um, I'm happy to send you to our publications here. We wrote a, a free report called VR 101, what parents need to know about VR on something called common sense media. Um, basically, we don't know much. Uh, what we do know, a lot of it's in the medical domain. There's been about seven or eight studies in the non-medical domain looking at kids and how they use VR. Our best data point comes from a scholar named Jackie Bailey. She's a professor at the University of Texas. And I'm going to show you a video from Jackie's dissertation study. Uh, Jackie worked with Sesame Workshop, uh, and uh, we wanted to ask the question using Sesame Street content, you know, how are kids affected by meeting Grover, the character from Sesame Street, either in television or in immersive VR? And the idea is we had half the kids who were either three years old, four years old, five years old, or six years old meet Grover in VR, and the other half meet them on a traditional TV interface. Let me show you what the VR looks like. Okay, ready? Oh, hello there! It's a sign! Your lovable furry friend, Grover! Hi! Get up out of your chair and dance with us! 
follow my crazy moves. You can do it. Okay, so you can see the intensity of meeting Grover in VR. Uh, it's also pretty intense for adults. Um, Jackie has three things she's looking at here in this study. Uh, the first thing she's looking at is something called executive function. So neuroscientists, you can't take a three-year-old and stick her in the magnet in the MRI machine. So you have to come up with creative ways in order to elicit what's going on in the brain. Uh, one of the ways you do that is you play this game called Simon Says. Do you guys know that game? Simon says, touch your nose, and then you say, touch your shoulders, and if you touch your shoulders without saying Simon says, you get it wrong. It turns out a metric for something called uh, uh, the ability to do inhibition is whether or not they fall for the gag when you, say, when you say do it without saying Simon says. In other ways, a way you can measure how developed a child's executive function is, is their ability to not touch their shoulder when you don't say Simon. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, when you meet Grover in VR, you fall for the non-Simon says more than when you meet him in TV. So the same way that, when, that adults can make kids fall for the Simon says gag face to face, it doesn't work on TV, but it does work in VR. The second metric we look at is compliance. Um, so you, you, know, you notice that they said, get out of your chair and dance with me, and the kid danced. We look at how often the child will obey the command given by the character. Uh, and much larger compliance rates in immersive VR compared to TV. Now, uh, this also works with adults, a little bit of a side. So I, I told you I run a lot of lab tours uh, in my lab. When we have an adult, and this could be the CEO of a very large company, it can be a, 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 a famous athlete, it doesn't matter who's in the room, when VR Grover tells you to dance, you dance. It's, it's almost impossible not to do. Uh, we had the CEO of Sesame uh, Workshop come to, come to the lab, uh, and he didn't want to come. He didn't, this VR thing, I don't want to do VR. And we put the goggles on him, and he got to meet Grover. Uh, he left there saying, this feels more real than the Muppets that we have on set. It's a, there's something really compelling about this. The final thing Jackie looks at, a lot of our lab's research asks the question, when you leave VR, does the effect linger? What's the effect of a VR experience on subsequent behavior? And what Jackie did is she gave these kids 10 stickers, physical stickers. It turns out little kids love stickers. And then she says, you know who else really loves stickers? Is Grover. How many do you want to give back to him? And you give more stickers to Grover when you met him in VR compared to TV. So uh, the point here is that kids are more affected by VR than they are uh, than TV in terms of whether they obey a command, uh, whether or not they share later on, and in terms of this executive function. So um, that's the, I won't call that bad news, but just something to know, which is that VR is a medium more powerful for kids, just like it is with adults. Now, the good news is Jackie's run hundreds of kids, you know, as young as three years old, and so far, none of them cried, none of them got hurt, none of that eye strain. We haven't had angry calls from parents uh, who said, you ruined my kid. Um, so in general, if you keep it to five minutes and the kids are meeting Grover in VR, it's OK. Um, so we can talk more about that later on. OK, so um, I'm done being negative. We're going to spend the rest of the talk being positive. But, but I wanted to frame the negative conversation, because the, the importance of doing so early is that my stand has always been VR is not for everything. VR is not for everything. Three years from now, uh, if you guys are putting on goggles to read your email, then I've done something wrong as, uh, as an evangelist for this technology. It's not for that. Okay? It's not for that. VR is so consuming. It might be addictive. It blocks you off from the physical world. You might get simulator sick over time. There's all these reasons to think about not doing it all the time. Therefore, we should save VR for experiences that if you were to do them in the real world, they would be impossible meaning you just simply can't do it, dangerous, a lesson that you'd learn but at some risk to yourself, counterproductive, meaning these are the types of experiences that make you better, but if you did them in the real world, uh, you wouldn't be happy that you did them. And the fourth is very expensive or rare that it's prohibitively so that you can't do them in the real world. Don't use VR for everything. Ration it for the experiences that, if you did them in the real world, meet one of these four standards. And I'm going to go over each of these individually. Start with impossible. So the, the first corporate grant that I got when I got to Stanford was from Cisco. The woman in charge of the grant was a brilliant executive named Marcia Satowski. And we were building kind of generic uh, or, or, or low-level avatar capture face tracking systems just to build communication technology for Cisco. But Marcia saw this demo, uh, which is the virtual mirror, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And she said, huh. Can you use VR to better think about training for diversity and inclusion? 
So the way that we typically train for diversity to understand issues of tolerance and others is you do an online web forum where you read about case studies and then you get tested, or you go to a, a, an auditorium where you do skits and role playing, and those are both fine, but none of them have changed much in the last few decades, and we can argue that there's many who make the argument that they're not so effective. When Marsha saw the virtual mirror demo, she said, can you use this to make people think about others in a different way? And we combined two theories, one of them old, one of them new. The older theory is something called the contact hypothesis. In the 1960s, uh, when there was segregation in schools, psychologists and sociologists came up with this theory, which is if you take different groups and you put them together, simply by having that contact with one another, they're going to learn to get along. Now, I just drastically simplified the theory, but in general, having people be united physically will cause them to overcome their differences. The second theory we combined here is uh, what the neuroscientists now call body transfer. And there's a famous paper from 12 years ago uh, that was published that shows that if you move your body physically and you see an avatar, a representation of, of a human that moves synchronously with you, that it takes about four minutes of you doing basic calisthenics and seeing your avatar move with you for body transfer to occur. And what this means is that you've got a part of the brain that lights up when you think about yourself. When you see that avatar, it also lights up. In other words, you extend this sense of self from a brain science standpoint to include this external avatar. So we combine these theories and we ask the question, what if you walk a mile in someone else's shoes? And I'll show you a video. Don't laugh at my graphics. This is a 15-year-old demo at this point, and I like to show you for the sense of history. Um, so this is Nick Yi, the genius that did a lot of this work, uh, an amazing student uh, that I had the privilege of working with. Nick is walking around the room. You can see the avatar there is a male. Nick walks up to the mirror. I'm going to show you this for 10 seconds. He does it for four minutes. He turns his head. Avatar moves with him. He does this for a while, looks to the side as avatar moves with him. He bends down at the, down at the knee. I hit a button. And now he comes back up and he's a woman of color. Okay? And the reaction that we get from subjects in these studies is as intense or more intense when that pit opens up from a fear of heights. Becoming someone else is just a hugely intense experience. The next phase of a typical experiment is we network a second person into the room with you. And you see yourself as having this other body. And that person proceeds to treat you very poorly based on your race, based on your gender, based on your age and to sometimes even physically assault you, depending on the different types of condition. You're walking a mile, wearing someone's body, where the brain is treating that body as real, and encountering very intense prejudice while wearing that body. Um, to give you an example of the type of studies that we run here, when it comes to this empathy type research, this, uh, this training people to, to reduce their bias and to behave in ways that are consistent with, with less bias, we never trust what we call self-report. All of us in this room want to be better. It's hard to change your actual minute to minute daily behavior. So we always look at what people do. And so here's a study where half the subjects role played. They imagined that they became physically impaired, visually impaired, excuse me. The other half, with the goggles, we took away their ability to see well. In other words, we made it so that they couldn't differentiate objects too well uh, by reducing the fidelity of the goggles. They then had to do this very difficult sorting task. They had to grab objects that were very similarly shaped and sized and sort them into piles based on that. When you had the normal fidelity vision in the goggles and you were role playing, it was really, really difficult to do maddeningly hard to do, but you could do it. Uh, in the other condition, it was just literally impossible to do. It was futile. 24 hours later, we contact subjects, and they've already been paid for the subject. They know the stu for the study. The, su the, the study's over. And we say, if you want to help people who are impaired, here's what you can do. You can surf the web, and you can email the webmasters and ask them to change the font of their web pages, change the color schemes, and you can have them uh, make their websites better for those who are impaired. We measure how much time they're doing this. When you become impaired, you spend twice as much time volunteering compared to when you'd role played that you were impaired. And this is the typical type of study that we run. We have probably run 20 or 30 of these over the last 15 years. You know, VR is not a magic medium. It doesn't solve all the world's problems. Uh, in general, when we run these studies, VR tends to outperform control conditions like watching a video or reading about case studies, but not every single time. You know, uh, really, it's about what the experience is in VR. But in general, what we're finding is that VR uh, works pretty well here. 
The second thing I want to talk about in, in terms of specific studies is that Fernanda Herrera, a uh, fourth year PhD student, PhD student in my lab, just published three days ago what I believe will become the canonical study in VR and empathy because of the level of rigor that she brought to it. So there's three things she did that no one else had done before. The first thing she did is that she got a very large sample. Uh, Fernanda built a mobile unit, uh, which is a, a VR system that she could take to museums and flea markets and senior citizens' homes. And she got was arguably the first large and not random, but certainly varied sample where we had lots of variance in socioeconomic status and age. Uh, and she got about 500 subjects. What they did is they put on the goggles and they did something called becoming homeless. Becoming Homeless is free to download on Steam if anybody would like to put it on their VR system. And the idea here, Becoming Homeless was designed to combat what uh, Stanford psychologist Lee Ross calls the fundamental attribution error. The fundamental attribution error, which has been around for 40 years, is the notion that when something bad happens to you, I blame your character. When something bad happens to me, I blame the situation. And all of us do this all the time. And that's uh, kind of one of these default heuristics that we tend to, to default to. Becoming homeless is a journey where it's very active in VR, where you, are, you basically learn that situational factors can cause people to become homeless. You lose your job. You get evicted. You try to sleep in your car. The cops throw you out. You're on this bus trying to sleep, and someone's harassing you. Really intense piece. After the piece is over, we hand you a petition, a piece of paper and a pen, and we say, it's an actual petition that is going to a proposition in California for some of the subjects. If you're not in California, we have come up with a different one. But it's an actual proposition. Are you willing to have your own personal taxes increased in order to support affordable housing measures? And we see if you physically sign this petition. And Fernanda just published uh, this, 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 this paper that's special for a few reasons. I mentioned one of them because of the large sample. The second thing she did is she looked two months after treatment. She found the same people two months later to look at the longitudinal effects of this really intense VR experience. The third thing that she did is she recruited my colleague Jamil Zaki, who is a social neuroscientist at Stanford, who is, in my opinion, the world's best scholar on the basic psychology of empathy. He's also a VR skeptic. Uh, he doesn't believe you know, this idea that VR is going to be the ultimate em empathy machine. And he chose control conditions, three of them, that are not you know, s conditions designed to fail. These are very uh, tried and true methods of producing perspective taking that people have been doing for 30 years now. Um, and you can download this paper. It's, it's published a few days ago free on Plus One. It's an open access journal. Uh, compared to control conditions, even eight weeks later, VR causes more pro-social behavior change than control. Now, I, do, I want to flag, VR does not solve all the world's problems. But this is the first instance of showing lasting behavior change compared to real crafted control conditions in a large sample. So uh, it's, it's a nice data point. You can think about transformation and empathy not just to others, but to yourself. And so this is Hal Hirschfield's research. Uh, he's now a professor in the business school at UCLA. Uh, he wanted to ask the question, can you get people to be better to themselves? And so a philosopher called Parfit has long argued that people are very good at imagining pleasure now, but we're really bad at imagining pain later on. In other words, all of us can think about the great dinner we're going to have you know, a few hours from now, but it's hard to think 50 years from now, if you don't have that dinner, then maybe in something more healthy, how your life's going to be. And where this resonated with Hal is in the realm of financial savings. Okay? So Hal cares a lot about people being in poverty in their 70s. And it turns out, if you look at the data, people who are in their 20s are not putting enough money in the bank. And the actuarial math folk have realized they're going to be in poverty when they're 70 years old. Due to medical advances, they're going to live till they're 90. So they're going to have 20 or 30 years of it in poverty because they're not putting money in the bank now. How can you get people to put money in the bank? So this is a study that's now a decade old, uh, the one that I'm showing you, uh, in terms of when we first designed it. We scanned people's faces have them walk into that mirror and do body transfer. And then we hit a button where an algorithm would age their face, a computer graphics algorithm, so they could see themselves in the mirror looking how they're going to look when they're 70 years old. They literally became older and met their future self in front of their eyes. Then what we did is we gave them the option. You can have 20 bucks now, or if you put in a savings account, you can have 40. Okay, nobody wants to do this. Everybody wants 20 bucks now. right? Uh, Compared to every control condition you can think of, looking at many, many studies over a five or six year period, Hal shows that meeting your future self viscerally, perceptually, causes more deferment of gratification compared to control conditions. So uh, we published this article in the Journal of Market Research. Um, 
But the neat thing, as VR has now gotten more commonplace, is that all of these findings that we've discovered in the lab, we have the opportunity to work with organizations to make products that people are going to use. And so the first financial institution that leveraged this, there's many of them working on this as we speak, was Bank of America Merrill Lynch. They built something called Face Retirement. And Face Retirement allows you to use the camera from your laptop to scan your face. It takes about 30 seconds for them to build a 3D model. And then what they do, if you form a B of A account today, you'll be asked, do you want to do face retirement? If you click yes, uh, they'll build your future self, and your future self becomes part of your online banking interface. So that every single financial decision you make, your future self is staring at you. Okay? <laughs> and, and the more money that you put in your savings account, the happier your future self gets. Okay? And, and this falls in the land of win-wins, right? Bank of America, Merrill Lynch has got more money in their accounts. 20-somethings are putting money in their savings. And it's a, it's a really, it's a special time to be, we are in this kind of infancy phase of VR. Everybody's looking for products to make, and it's a really a special time for you guys to be attacking the win-win area. There's so many of these out there. Okay. Um, this empathy research, there's so many applications. So this is a picture of Roger Goodell coming to my lab. Um, and why this is a special reason is Roger, and more importantly, Troy Vincent, the vice president of operations of the NFL, they didn't come to learn about sports. They want the NFL to be known as the best place to work from a cultural standpoint. And we've been doing a lot of work with the NFL uh, and many other organizations subsequently to think about how to use VR as a way to integrate into their diversity training. Um, so one thing we built was the flight simulator of interviews. Okay, so why do we have VR in general? In 1929, a guy named Edwin Link decided, I want to learn how to fly, but I don't want to do it from a, a handbook, from a manual. How do we learn? We do stuff, we make mistakes, and we get feedback, and we repeat. That's how humans learn. Flying, this is very dangerous, right? You're in a plane, you shouldn't be making mistakes. Uh, hence, the flight simulator it gives you the opportunity to do and to get feedback by making mistakes without any harm. We built the same thing for doing interviews. Now, uh, when one does interviews, all of us in this room have been interviewed. I'd say most of us have per perhaps given interviews. There's mistakes that we make. So depending on someone looks, we'll ask a different question. Depending on how somebody uh, looks, we'll look in different places. Uh, our facial expressions will change based on who's in front of us. Now, all people are biased. All of us are biased. We can't really control this. Uh, there's not anything that I've seen in the data that shows that it, there's a reliable way to change a person's bias. But what we can do is learn how to behave in a way that doesn't make others feel bad based on that bias, okay? And so what we've built is a flight simulator for interviews, and this was built for the NFL in particular. Uh, there's something called the Combine, and at the Combine, players go to try out for teams, uh, but they don't try out only athleti athletically. There is an interview phase where they have to, you know, talk about themselves and how they'd fit in on the team culture, et cetera. And we built an interview trainer for general managers and executives to practice giving an interview uh, for the combine. And the idea is you give an interview, then in VR, you're sitting across from yourself. We replay the interview, and you get to be feel the interview from the perspective of the other person while you're giving the interview to you. And you get to see that. And you say, oh, man, uh, OK. And then you get to do it again. And you get to be coached on this both by a human coach looking over your shoulder in some cases, and by an algorithmic coach. Just uh, show them a heat map of where they've been looking in the interview. You know, why did I look in different places for a man and a woman? Well, let's try it again. And the idea is you make mistakes and you iterate. And um, one of my favorite things, we've got demos here with all sorts of, uh, the beauty is that you can change the representation of the other person um, uh, really easily. And w in my lab, we give lots of these demos and we run lots of these studies. What we like to see, and it's going to sound weird, I like it when somebody says or looks in an inappropriate way in VR. Because that's when you want you to make the mistake and give you the feedback. It's a place for you to get better based on your bias. In other words, you know, if you've ever done any diversity training exercises, it often ends with, boom, you're biased. And then you go home and you think about that. Uh, what this is is a way for you to practice you know, in a small way not exhibiting that bias. Over the last few years, we've done a lot of work now where we're actually building curated content and, and using this at scale. Um, so I want to talk about a project called Thousand Cut Journey. Uh, and uh, my genius colleague, her name is 
Courtney Cogburn. She's a professor at Columbia. She studies black-white racism uh, in terms of how it affects health and from a public policy standpoint, as well as from a psychological standpoint. For the last two years, we've been building a piece called Thousand Cut Journey. The idea is it's designed to show implicit bias, but not explicit racism, more subtle stuff. Think death by a thousand cuts is Courtney's vision. And we spent years on this project where you become Michael Sterling, a black male, and you start in kindergarten, or you start in elementary school, and then you go, you're a teenager, and then you're an adult, and you're wearing uh, a black body that's been induced via body transfer, and you experience racial bias over the course of your lifetime. Uh, again, we've been working this for quite some time. We just premiered this uh, at the film fest at the Tribeca Film Festival this past April. They've got a VR wing where we premiered this, and um, what we're doing now, we're running three different studies with it. One of one of them is a cohort study, uh, which means you take an entire group of people and you watch them over time. Uh, Columbia University has allowed us to make this part of the uh, orientation for the incoming new students, and we're going to follow these students over time. Half of whom have done this, half of whom who have not, to see how it affects. Uh, their attitudes later on. The second study we're running is a classic lab study where you do something called the implicit association task. This is a standard measure of bias with reaction time. Uh, the third thing that we're doing is a large scale study with thousands of subjects. We're basically sending this out to film festivals and other places and collecting data inside VR based on it. So uh, I don't have any data for you with this, but if you like this idea, there's a scholar, his name is Mel Slater. Mel Slater from Barcelona has probably got five to 10 studies looking at racial bias reduction uh, in VR. Okay, so the, um, that was a long journey to th doing things that are impossible to do in VR, changing yourself. Can't do, can't do that in the real world very easily. I want to shift now to things that are counterproductive to do in VR. So the idea here, are these are things that you sh if you did them in the real world, you'd learn something really important about yourself, but it's probably not something you want to do. And um, my academic hero here is a woman named Dr. Jane Lubchenco. Uh, Dr. Lubchenco was the head of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration under President Obama for four years. In that four-year window, she saw more natural disaster than in any four-year window in U.S. history. Um, of course, this is due to climate change. Scientists are in consensus upon that. However, uh, about a third of our citizens, half of our lawmakers, and our current president do not believe in climate change. How do you get people to understand the intense time pressure we are under to solve this problem? And the quote from Dr. Lubchenco is, when people directly experience something, they see it in a different light. And she tells a story of when uh, she was visiting a district uh, that had been ravaged by a natural disaster. And she gets off the helicopter, and a congressman from a district that was one of the more public climate change deniers, she gets off the helicopter and he says, Jane, I've seen the light. I've become a believer. That's a direct quote. I've seen the light. I've become a believer. Because the natural disaster had hit his district, he now had a firsthand experience of natural disaster, perhaps caused by climate change, and he shifted his opinions. You know, since I've been giving this talk, there's a much easier example, which is Republican lawmakers from Florida believe in climate change. Why? because Florida is already facing economic pressures based on climate change. So uh, why this is relevant to VR is natural disaster is free in VR. You experience it, but nobody gets hurt. So the first study we'll talk about here is work from Sunju An, who now runs a VR lab at the University of Georgia. And she wanted to get people to actually do conservation. So all of us in this room, you know, we want to sort out the foil from the paper as we walk through the hallways here at the UW. We don't want to want to throw them into one. We want to carpool, but changing your daily behavior is really hard. And so how can you get people who say they want to do the right thing to actually change their behavior? And so uh, Sunju's study uh, was based on a New York Times article from 2009 that said if you use that soft, fluffy toilet paper that everybody loves, it turns out that soft, fluffy toilet paper is made from non-recycled pulp. 50% of which comes from second growth forest, 10% comes from virgin trees. So we are deforesting for probably not an essential task using toilet paper. That article comes out in 2009. I live in the Bay Area, which is a pretty crunchy place. Uh, if you go to most of the supermarkets, there will be one or two brands of recycled toilet paper. A lot of stores don't even carry it. So, you know, Leslie's article, though brilliant, didn't change behavior. Sunju ran a series of studies where she had people, everybody got the stats that you just got. And then there was three groups of subjects. One group read a beautifully written narrative, what we'd like to cut down a tree. The second group saw a, a video shot from the shoulder of a lumberjack. The third put on the goggles, had a haptic device that shook their hands like a chainsaw, and had to cut down two trees. And when the trees fell, the floor shaked and boomed their legs up. 
really intense experience. I get phone calls from people. They say, they say, Jeremy, I, I, I just went to the toilet paper aisle and I, I thought about you today uh, because because <laughs> they've been because they've been to the lab and, and 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 you know we're after that. That's what we're after. Um, but we never trust self-report. Everybody says they want to be green. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to Uber to the airport after this talk. Am I going to get a shared Uber? Or probably not. And despite me giving this talk, maybe we'll talk about it given the time. Uh, so everybody got the stats. And we asked them before and after their, their intentions to recycle. All three groups, reading the, 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 the narrative, seeing the video, and doing VR, said they were going to use less paper. The only group that changed their actual behavior was the group that cut down the tree in VR, the one that actually got the sensory motor feedback from doing it. Um, they reduced their paper use by 20% later on, and the study has been replicated. So we know that cutting down a tree causes you to use less paper. Here's where we get long-winded back to the counterproductive part. If I were to teach you guys about deforestation by forcing you to cut down physical trees, that'd be a really ridiculous way to do it. VR gives you the best of both worlds. On, you can go and search for something called the Stanford Ocean Acidification Experience. It is free to download uh, for most VR platforms. It's a seven-minute journey where you learn about how climate change is affecting our coral reefs. There's a special reef off the coast of Naples, Italy, off an island of Ischia, where this reef basically proves that climate change, uh, CO2 devastation, is going to uh, destroy all of life as we know it underwater. There won't be fish for your grandkids to eat uh, in 80 years. This ocean acidification research has been published widely in Science and Nature, all the best journals. But I won't ask you to raise your hands. If I were to, uh, only 10 of you in this room would know what ocean acidification is. We built this 11-minute journey, um, and we've done a lot of things with it. Uh, First of all, we put it and studied it in classrooms and showed that students do learn. Uh, they do show engagement, and they learn uh, about the ocean and about marine science. Um, in addition to the efficacy of learning, there's the motivation of learning. So this is a screenshot um, from the 2016 Tribeca Film Festival where uh, Jane Rosenthal, the genius that runs this uh, event, she's got this huge warehouse with all this VR. We had a booth set up for 11 hours a day for seven days straight. We had a line of 100 adults for the entire time waiting to learn about chemistry. Okay? You don't get that from a textbook. VR is fun. People want to do it. So there's a, a motivation aspect. Um, we've done a lot of work with policy. This is a screenshot at the U.S. Senate. We gave a briefing to a number of senators and congresswomen and congressmen. Um, we're doing a lot of work now in the lab where we bring lawmakers. Either they come to the lab or we bring it to them with the goal of showing them firsthand things like climate change. It's a really neat tool to think about how to get the legislators who are making decisions, quote, unquote, firsthand experience with the content uh, that we're doing. Okay, so that's a counterproductive bucket. Um, expensive and rare is probably the bucket that a lot of VR experiences that you've tried falls under. And for this, I want to talk about uh, Derek Belch. Okay, so Derek Belch took my virtual people class in the year 2005. Uh, he was the field goal kicker for the Stanford team. Uh, here, you know this in the Pac-12. Uh, you may remember um, that we, in that, some of you may remember in 2005 we were, 2006, we were 41-point underdogs against USC. Uh, Derek kicked the extra point to, to win the game by one point. Uh, um, so Derek took my virtual people class, which is this VR class, and afterwards said, Jeremy, can we use VR to train athletes? I said, Derek, it's a brilliant idea. Come back in a decade. And, and Derek did. He went out and got a, uh, an MBA, and he got a journalism degree, uh, and he came back, and he was an assistant coach on the Stanford football team while he got his master's thesis in my lab. And he did the Herculean task of convincing Coach David Shaw, uh, who's a brilliant forward-thinking individual. He convinced Coach Shaw to give us five minutes of practice time on Mondays. Uh, coaches choreographed practice down to 30-second chunks. So the fact that Coach gave us five minutes was uh, amazing. Um, and what we did in those five minutes, the quarterback left. We put a 360 camera rig, which was very difficult to do back then, obviously very easy to do now. And we would film from the quarterback's field of view pre-snap before the ball snapped. Uh, when the quarterback goes to the line of scrimmage, um, he's got to look around and rec look at the defense. Uh, the Stanford defense on those plays pretended to be the team we were going to play that Saturday and threw out very complicated blitz packages that that team was known for. Um, we filmed uh, you know, about 20 plays in that five-minute chunk from the perspective of the quarterback on these complicated plays. We would then go back to the lab and stitch this all together. By Wednesday, we'd have this back in the football office and 
the quarterbacks on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday would practice. And what they're practicing is not throwing and kicking and running. They're practicing decision-making. When a quarterback goes to the line of scrimmage, he basically can do three things. He can let it roll, just keep the original play. He can go to the next play in the queue. He walks up there with probably four plays, which, uh, which is kill, 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 to go to the next one down. Or for either of those options, he can ask a running back behind him to move uh, to pick up a blocker. So he's got three decisions to make, uh, walk to the line of scrimmage. And pre-snap, it's an utter cacophony. There's people running around, yelling and screaming, uh, and he's got about three or four seconds of defense trying to mask its, its pattern, and he's got to decide what to do. After three weeks, it was working so well that Coach Shaw made it mandatory for the players to use as opposed to this optional thing that was sitting there. And that season, Stanford outperformed expectations. Both our quarterback, Kevin Hogan, as well as the coach, David Shaw, said one of the many reasons Stanford did so well that year was because of the VR use uh, in this instance. So Derek graduates January 2nd, 2015. Uh, like many Stanford students, on January 3rd, he's got a startup. Um, the startup is called Striver. Uh, and Derek graduates. Uh, and then three months later, he shocks the world by signing six NFL teams to multi-year contracts. Uh, here's some of the teams that he's currently working with. Um, this is just a, a splash of them. Um, a lot of teams are using this right now. And there's tons and tons of efficacy data now that show athletes, whether they're U.S. Olympic skiers, players on the German national soccer team, uh, NBA free throw, through show, free throw shooters who are getting better, tons of data showing that this increases efficacy. But then we had a weird thing happen. One of the teams that we train is the Arkansas Razorbacks. And uh, we are giving demos in Arkansas where the head of training from Walmart, which is also based in Arkansas, came, he's a big football fan, came in, put on the goggles, you know, looked at this football training, and said, huh, turns out which this, this, this sequence that you just talked about, which is look around, recognize a pattern, make a decision based on that pattern, and then tell your other people around you about that decision, is a skill that all of our employees need. And so what we did is the new CEO of Walmart has built something called a training academy. And what he decided is that if you work at Walmart, at any point you should be able to get in your car and drive that day to go to a training academy where for a week you can become a better manager, a better employee. It's a boot camp to get better at your job. So we started off in one of these training academies and um, were there for a few months and qualitatively uh, people liked it. They seemed to be learning well, they enjoyed it, uh, and it was a tool that both managers and employees liked. The next phase was we took 30 Walmart training academies and we paired them with 30 academies, roughly the same demographic, same size. 30 of them had VR training, 30 of them didn't. And what we demonstrated quantitatively was that the people that went through the academies that had VR did better than the ones that did not, both in terms of their learning right afterwards as well as on their job later on. In 2017, most people don't know this, it's public, but for some reason this hasn't really resonated. 200,000 Walmart employees put on the goggles to learn their job better in VR. So what would you do in VR for Walmart? Um, we talked about walking the plank. For me personally, the scariest thing I've ever done in VR is what they call holiday rush. This is the day before Thanksgiving and you're in the goggles and people are screaming at you and getting in your space. Uh, really intense experience that's rare, but due to high turnover, Walmart employees, only one in two of them have been uh, during there for holiday rush. Um, so it's a really neat way to train them. There's about 20 other examples that we've built for them. Uh, so a really neat use case, and I'm going to show you a tweet that Walmart just put out a couple days ago, uh, which is by the end of the year, we'll have deployed 17,000 VR headsets for training. As of a few days ago, uh, we have officially signed a deal to put two to four VR training stations in every single one of Walmart's 4,700 stores. And this is the huge scaling up uh, of VR training. Um, you know, we literally had to call Facebook and order 17,000 Oculus Go's. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty neat moment in the history of VR where at scale you're using this. And in the Q&A, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, Striver is working with about 25 Fortune 500 companies. Each use case is very different from the next. I'm happy to talk about more of them. Final bucket I want to talk about is using VR for things that if you did them in the real world would be dangerous, okay? And what I'm going to talk about is dangerous right now is driving, okay? How many people were killed in car accidents in the United States last year? 40,000 people died in car crashes last year. You know, uh, in the worst year of my life for, in terms of a public event was 9-11. Uh, there were almost 10 times as many people killed by automobiles than terrorists that year in the United States. Cars are bad. 
cars are bad. Now, I'm not saying that we should get rid of the travel we want to do. Go see your loved ones. Go outside and play with people. Uh, but there is this major sub factor of travel, a subset of travel, which is travel that we have to do. And I want to use VR. This is the, the network VR platform, High Fidelity, uh, to, to do that. Now, I want to talk a little bit about AR. Uh, David, if I go to five after, is that OK? Yep. OK, I'll be done in five minutes for it, and then hopefully we'll have a good bunch of questions for you. Um, for a long, many years, I've been studying social networked avatars literally since 1999, trying to understand which affordances do you need to focus on. Is it eye contact? Is it haptics for a handshake? What are the features that make this social presence work? Uh, for those that care about this topic, uh, Catherine O, oh, a grad student in my lab, she just published uh, two weeks ago in a journal called Frontiers, a review of every single study that's ever looked at, quote, social presence, uh, which is the feeling that another person is there with you in VR. It literally has every study listed there in a nice table if you want it. So I've been studying this for a while, and I'm really bullish on VR, networked VR. Um, in terms of AR, so uh, I have four PhD students in my lab. Currently, two of them do nothing but study AR all day. We just got two NSF grants where for the next three years we will be studying um, social interaction in augmented reality. And I want to talk about you know, a bit of history. So the first time I ever did immersive VR was in 1994. I did a beta video game. Uh, I was interviewing for grad school at Berkeley, and I had a few hours to kill. And I went to the Embarcadero uh, along the bay there. And there was an arcade that was playing uh, a video game there called Dactyl Nightmare. And I put on the goggles. And this thing was just a, a nightmare from a technical standpoint. It was running at 10 hertz. The latency was probably a quarter second. The tracking was off by centimeters. But it still made me see, wow. This is what I want to do with my life. I drastically shifted my field to leave cognitive science, become a VR guy. Um, and over the last two decades, I hadn't had this experience in AR. I hadn't. It had been kind of cool, but I hadn't said, wow, this is really is going to be something special. And I want to talk about uh, some work that my current PhD students are doing that, that gave me this aha moment. So um, what you're seeing here is a screenshot of what my students did is they took a realistic, you know, fairly realistic 3D avatar, and they, they registered it about right here in the physical room. And they had me stand way over here. Why that's relevant is that the HoloLens or the Magic Leap has fairly small field of view. If you want to see the, the whole human, you've got to be far apart. Then what they did is they rendered, in my field of view, this avatar. And he was moving and gesturing and talking. And then Mark Miller, the PhD student that put this together, he choreographed it so that he was standing next to where he knew this thing would be, and he timed it so that he was talking to and kind of interacting with it. So this is the idea of when we can do truly networked, captured telepresence avatars. This is how it's going to look. But this is the first time I saw it. So just to summarize, I was sitting here wearing the HoloLens, and I got to see that. Basically, a person got beamed into the room. That person was integrated into the conversation with us. And this light bulb just went I mean, we talk about you know, use cases here. If you can bring people into the room, and I know you guys have thought about this, uh, but I urge all of you, this is not a hard demo to set up. Try this demo, and I think it's going to inspire you. I really do. Uh, I've tried a lot of social VR, and it's great. But the notion of integrating an augmented reality person uh, into the room uh, is, is a good one. OK. The final thing I'm going to talk about is uh, as a paper we're about to submit. And I'm going to be very general about this because it hasn't been published. Um, and there's three PhD students that are the leads on this. Uh, it's Mark Miller, Hansel June, and Fernanda Herrera. I want to give them credit for this work. Um, AR is a unique medium because it takes really perceptually compelling events and puts them in the spaces that we know and love. And the question that we're asking in this line of research is, how is AR going to change the very basic way that people communicate? And I'm going to start on the first study. And we're going to call this one Ghosts. This is Mark Miller's lead study. And there is a study that was published first in 1898 by a psychologist named Triplett. And it's called Social Facilitation, and then subsequently demonstrating social inhibition. Hundreds of studies replicating this very basic social psychological phenomenon. Social facilitation states that if I'm doing an easy task and there's people in the room watching me, I do better. If I'm doing a hard task and there's people in the room watching me, I do worse compared to being alone in both of those instances. Social facilitation, social inhibition. Now, think about AR at scale. 
we're going to be walking around and we're going to have, you know, some instantiation of Alexa and Siri with us and our buddies networked in from Cleveland and there's going to be a cacophony of virtual humans, whether they're AI or real people, scattered around the room and all of us are going to be doing fairly mundane tasks while we're having AR presences rendered in front of us. And so Mark has just finished running a study. You have to do a very f a physical task, which is rearrange letters and anagrams. And they're either easy ones or hard ones. And you have to do it while a AR human is aware of you and watching you. Okay? And what he demonstrates is the classic pattern of do worse for hard tasks, do better for easy tasks when ARs are represented. So that's the ghosts. The gargoyle study, uh, this is uh, Jacob's uh, master's thesis that Fernando Herrera has been working on. This, have you guys read the book Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson? Okay, buried within, there's two paragraphs that talk about gargoyles. Gargoyles are people walking around in public using VR and AR, and he calls them gargoyles because they're not even human. They're just twitching and touching things that aren't there, and they're, they're just uh, gargoyles. Uh, so Jacob's study and Fernando's study had two people interacting having a conversation, doing kind of a get-to-know-you task that you see a lot in business schools and negotiations, one of which is wearing the HoloLens and seeing 3D objects, the other one which is not. And what, we what we're studying in this one is the differential perceptions of the other person one, when one's wearing AR and the other one's not. There's this concept of VR called presence. Presence means I feel the VR world is, 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 is there and I'm in it. We're working on a construct for AR which is called absence. When I'm in AR, there's digital stuff with me. How absent am I from the physical world? And what, that's the data that we're showing there. The final one, and this is haunted houses. This asks uh, a question. Um, so in this study, we take two chairs. OK. Can, can you volunteer and help me? You don't know this result, do you? I didn't talk with this with you? Please go over there. I've never tried this in public. This is the first time I'm actually presenting this. OK. So please come and sit down and share. OK. Two things. One, did he sit on me? No. OK. Two, thank you. You can sit down again. Thank you. <laughs> when he walked towards me, you may saw he did this in terms of the rotation and not this. Did you see that? Really basic stuff. But Han Sul had a, you had a conversation with an embodied agent in AR. The agent then went and sat down and sat in one of those chairs. In study one, 30 people are asked to sit down. Nobody sits on the agent. Nobody turns their back on the agent as they walk to it. So kind of a basic demonstration of the social presence of these. But from an application standpoint, think about this at scale. All of us are wearing AR and are seeing our own versions of stuff. but the Basic patterns of locomotion in a room are going to change based on things that only we are seeing, right? And so, you know, the, the rotation angle is something that we weren't actually looking for, but it was something that was just real big aha moment, which is people are going to really change the way they're going to walk. Um, anyway, but that's not the haunted houses parts. That's, we're still in the ghost territory here because he's still there. The haunted houses parts, this takes the idea that we know memory works contextually. Okay. We associate things with places where we've learned it. Um, have, has anyone played the uh, AR HoloLens video game called Fragments? Um, it's it's a, you download it for like 10 bucks if you like it for the HoloLens. Um, Fragments builds a scan of your room, and then there's a narrative that takes place in the video game where there is an event that happens, and it's registered such that you know there's a guy there's a guy with his gun with a gun to a kid's head, and it's right on the floor. It's not in the table. They register it in place uh, on the wall. They'll put a window, and the window becomes part of the narrative. In other words, they scan your room and they reform the location of what happens in the game to fit in your room. Does that make sense? Okay. And so you go through this video game. Um, well, the question that I'm asking long term in this research is that we know that AR is registered to your physical location. We know that memory works in general contextually. So if you think about the best thing that ever happened in your life, if you go to that spot, it's going to be pretty awesome. If the worst thing that ever happened in your life, if you go there, you're going to feel bad. And so what's going to happen in a world in which very intense AR events are happening in places where we're very familiar? What's the scariest movie you've ever seen? The Shining. Uh, so imagine you're in your bedroom watching The Shining, and those twins are actually walking on your bed, picking up your pillows. You know, they're in your bedroom. And 
that's not a stretch. I mean, that's what Fragments does. It's one of the first video games there. AR entertainment content is going to integrate the physical world. Um, so back to Hansul studies. If that avatar, if I were sitting right here, I'm not going to ask you guys to do this now because I've already ruined it once. If I was sitting here, you know, for an hour, and the chair got nice and warm, and then I got up and I said, "Please sit down." You'd probably sit on that one, right? You wouldn't sit on the one that I just got up from. And in AR, when the avatar was sitting there, you also still sit on the other one. So preliminary data that AR experiences are going to change the way that you uh, behave in the physical world. Uh, let's just go right to questions. Yeah. I know that some of your work has studied uh, gender differences in terms of like social equilibrium in VR and stuff. How do you see that playing out in um, different contexts in terms of the same effects generalizing. So I'd be really careful at interpreting the one published study on differences in uh, equilibrium for men and women. I'd be careful. It's a small sample study. Um, I have been told by some experts here that do look at this that if you actually build an IPD, uh, interpupillary distance that works for women, that whatever effects that are there go away. But I think even before we claim that that's there, um, we want to be careful that, uh, you know, that that study got a ton of press. And Dana Boyd, who's an amazing scholar, love her work. You know, it's, just, it's the kind of thing that, you know, all, we just need to have a few replications of that. Um, in general, we should be designing our stuff for not just uh, the, the people who work in the company. So um, there's, a, there's a mistake that I've seen happen three times in the face tracking community for, for the public products. And I can name the companies, but the first time we saw it was back in the late 90s uh, for, 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 for companies that are selling computer vision software that can track your face. A lot of these companies are four or five people. They're often white males. They're spending literally hundreds of hours a month testing this on themselves. So there comes to be an implicit bias in the software, not intentional. It's just they're testing these algorithms on themselves, and they're white males. So then you put a woman in there, doesn't work. Person of color doesn't work. And I think you're seeing some of that on the HMD design, which is that you know where the, the people who work for these companies are are a certain type, and so we have to be better about including more people in the prototyping phase. Yeah. Yeah. I think the the warm-up training is really interesting. But, um, can you speak up, please? Okay. Um, <coughs> uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Cool. Um, I think Walmart training is really interesting, but um, if training contains some kind of risky part, for example, you're making like a cafe latte in the, the Starbucks, then um, um, probably you want to avoid to uh, burn your hand by the steam, and hot steam. But um, you can also do that training inside the virtual reality to enhance your skills. So how do they learn to avoid the, the risky situation? I, so if there's something that can be done easily, for example, using a machine that costs $80, you know, probably don't need VR, right? So I, I, one of the, my, my biggest jobs is to tell people not to use VR when it's inappropriate, when it's gratuitous. And so we really try to save things for uh, events that would be really hard to do with actors or otherwise. So Holiday Rush, you've got a 1,000 people literally, so that's expensive to do. Um, for something like uh, you know, the coffee machine, my prediction, and I don't know coffee machines that well, is that the way the subtle micro-movements are critical and our haptic devices aren't good enough to use it yet. So in general, there's a host of lots of good research putting people in very dangerous spots in VR training firefighters, training police officers, training soldiers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you showed a lot of uh, exciting experiments on like transference and um, the characters and the, the empathy that you can get. Uh, but getting people into those outside of like a study, um, a lot of people there's a lot of hesitation for people to want to go in and have their mind changed while they can't rip the goggles off or something. Um, so with that in mind, do you think it's it's ethical to put um, experiences like that in inside of other content where you? don't know that they're going in to learn about not using toilet paper, but th that's what they come out with. Yeah, so um, two things to unpack there. One is there's not wide-scale use of VR. When people are doing VR, they're not really choosing to um, you know, learn about chemistry and to, to have you know, traumatic experiences because they've changed their identity. So um, uh, I, I'm agreeing that, you know, when I put Becoming Homeless on Steam, you can look at it. Of all the comments, I would say there's some positive ones, but there's a whole bunch of griefers. And uh, it's not, I wouldn't say it's the most popular download on Steam, uh, Becoming Homeless. Uh, so I don't know how to solve that problem. I could, I could pretend to say, well, if you, there's a way you can build it so it's gamified, but also interesting. And that's really hard to do. And I, I, I you know, I, I don't think I can do that personally. And I haven't met someone to do that. So the question becomes, 
becomes, when does it become part of curriculum? So right now at Stanford, every 18 months I've, I am forced to do diversity training, and you know, I would love it if VR was a part of it. That would be great. So there's some context where it can work. Um, otherwise, you, you, your, your ethical question about can we sneak it in, you know, uh, it, it depends if it's this, you know, I haven't seen that done. I get enough hate mail as it is, so I'm, I'm not going to do it myself. Edutainment. Yeah, please. Would edutainment not be what he's talking about? I, look, some edutainment works. I just, I haven't, I, I personally, so I would call most of what I've built, uh, the three things we have free for download on, on, on all the platforms are Becoming Homeless, the Stanford Ocean Acidification Experience, and Coral Compass. It's about climate change adaptation in Palau. And those are edutainment, and I just can't build it well enough to make people prefer that to Fortnite. <laughs> yeah. So w one of the things you've, you've, you're, you've mentioned multiple times is that you shouldn't use VR for things that you, could, that it, you don't need to use it for, basically. So I'm, it seems like a lot of the investment in the space by the major companies have been under the assumption that this is going to be this mass consumer medium that you know, the average person will be using it. Um, Soon. Like, first of all, do you think that, that that's true? Um, and um, I'm also curious if there's if there's some some set of breakthroughs that have to occur in order to make that true. So first of all, um, I'm going to answer your first one. But if I actually knew the answer to the first one, I'd be a wealthy and famous man. Uh, I, I, uh, the Valley, where I spent a lot of time, and VCs flow through my lab, and the big companies come through my lab, and we, you know, uh, I could tell you details about that that aren't necessary. Yes, they all believe that someday we're going to be using VR like the smartphone. And most VR veterans that I know looked at these people and said, no, that's not, we never, you know, if you, if you, so if you read my first book that I wrote with Jim Blass, which in 2010, we've got a chapter in the applications. We never thought of movies. Right? We never thought of video. Like video games are great from an economic standpoint. Like people, it's like the U.S.'s best export right now. They're amazing. Why would you want to mess it up by sticking you in goggles and make it so you can't talk to your friends and you can't do it for eight hours? I, uh, so um, when I talk to those people, and the list is long of people who have sometimes listened to me before they bought companies and sometimes not, uh, I always say, no, do not. The VR is going to be terrible for video games. It's going to be. It's going to be. No, don't do it for that. And. You know, I, I, you know a lot of these old timers in VR, and, and I don't know any of us that were talking about, you know, watching a two hour long feature film in VR. It just never made sense to us. So I, I think there's a, there's a disconnect between the people that have been in VR for a while, and I don't think it's a hardware thing. I think the hardware is really cheap. It's the same price as a, as a, a video game platform, and I think it's pretty comfortable. I, 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 so I, I don't think if you magically make it look a little cooler that people are going to be spending hours and hours there. So. Um, that's my two cents on, you know, if it will get adapted. What was the second question? I think you already asked about their hardware you know, breakthroughs that will. Um, the hardware breakthrough that, 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 that Gordon said when he was here is if we solve this disconnect of urgence and accommodation, we actually don't have data on that, that, that you're not going to get sick if that happens. I, 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 you know, I think it's amazing. It's going to make things better. And I've seen some, some demos that give you continuous version. I, I, I'm not convinced it's a hardware thing. I'm convinced that, you know, Look, I'm wrong every day about media. I, I, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, would people prefer to be doing this than hanging out with people who are right there in front of them, including spouses and kids and uh, you know, myself included? I'm not judging. It's really hard to predict this stuff. But I, I don't think it's a form factor thing. I just think VR is not for everything. And I don't think AR is for everything. Yeah? Uh, um, I'm really interested about um, uh, the appreciation, like becoming homeless, teaching people about uh, empathy. So I'm just wondering, do you think it's a good study to using uh, those applications to the um, criminal people like in the prison to uh, re-education re them or teach them, uh, I mean, how to treat people well to yeah. increase the wellness behavior? So the two answers to that question, the question is, does this work well for people who are incarcerated? Um, the first answer is, as we learn when you do any experimentation on human subjects, uh, prisoners are a special population. So you have to be very careful when we talk about experimenting on prisoners. Um, second, as I would look to, there's a company out of New York called Ensenia, uh, and they've done a lot of work, for example, teaching people how to use the checkout aisle, uh, teaching people how to use laundry, uh, crowded places as, wa as ways to get people who, are, who have been in there for 30 years before they come out. I think it's a nice application. I really, I think it's one of those applications that works. Yeah. 
So you mentioned the embodiment of like Siri and Alexa, um, that's becoming more and more common today. Yeah. Um, so where do you think it'll go when sort of AI combines with these avatars? And yeah. from a cognitive like psychology standpoint, how does that affect your yeah. perception of other people and you know with your family and so on and so forth? So uh, the first study of many in this line, uh, Greg Welch, my collaborator, uh, we worked with him and they did 99% of the work here. So this is really their study I'm describing. Uh, Alexa got a body and Alexa got a body that was interactive. So three conditions, Alexa, turn off the light. One condition, the light just goes off. No, condition two is Alexa, turn off the light and you see Alexa and she looks to the light and it goes off. Alexa, condition three is Alexa, turn off the light and she actually walks somebody to wear the lens and flips off the light. So you actually get to see an embodiment, an embodiment that consistently verifies the behavior was done. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a preliminary data set we just published this that Ismar presented this. Ismar was what, five days ago, last week? Yeah, so we just presented this brand new data. Um, in general, people trust and prefer the ones that have the animation sequence. So that's the first piece of data that we have, but we're going to be doing a ton of research on this because we just got a grant to study that for three years. Yeah. yeah. So from an empirical perspective, like how do you, like are there any tips of designing control conditions that compare different mediums? Uh, for example, like VR and then like maybe like computer interaction, things like that? Yeah, it really depends on where you want to publish the work. Um, so, you know, the, the, the kind of the fallback control condition is often let's do a VR immersive compared to, say, desktop. Um, a, a condition people often suggest that we almost never do is the face-to-face -face control condition because, you know, as Jaron Lanier says, that the best moment in VR for him is when he takes the goggles off and he sees how amazing the real world is. You know, there's so many differences between the real world and VR. Um, uh, so that the face-to-face -face one is, though, I'd like to see more of that. Um, here's what I think has been understudied. So in my lab now, uh, we try to include a longitudinal component to almost all the work we do, meaning we look at the effect of a treatment a month later, two months later. We're trying to do that in everything we do. Um, what's missing drastically from the field is the effect of repeated doses. So you do VR once, twice, three times in a week. You repeat that for a few months compared to just once. Uh, that's a, the literature needs that control condition of time. So time for one more. Are there any questions? Yeah. So if you have to predict, like, what will be the most, in your opinion, what will be the most useful thing in, like, 10 years in AR or VR? Like, where, where, where will it be, like, a positive, where will it be used? I, so I, I think the, the most useful thing in 10 years will be having photorealistic humans beamed into the room, whether it be AR or VR. Uh, that detail I care less about. I, I truly think that so much of travel, I mean, look, we had a great lunch together, and now we know each other in a way that we wouldn't have had you just beam this avatar here. But, you know, I, I've literally flown, I flew to Borneo, 29-hour flight each way to give a 45-minute talk about climate change. Like, how ridiculous is that? Uh, and there's, some, there's so much time that, there, there's so much travel we can just knock out. And I think of all the real, you know, use cases that are going to save the world, getting rid of travel. We can't be 11 b billion people on the planet and driving an hour to work each day and back. It just can't happen. Okay. Thanks, guys. All right.